are doing me a huge favor. I, I loved it when you were on uh, the IG live that we did together, in which uh, the viewers, they got addicted to you. Matter of fact, by the time they see this, they're going to be really upset that I didn't do another live because they were loaded with questions for you, uh, especially after it was done. And many have requested that you come back and we will do a live together, but I wanted to have this time as an audience of one with you so that you can go through this process and give an overview of your program because I find uh, it, uh, as well as you, uh, a fascinating person uh, to learn from. But I'm going to ask you about trauma because that pretty much was a part of the main discussion that we talked about. It's something that you uh, do and specialize in. Everyone talks about it. Mm. Everyone is affected by it in one measured degree or another. Mm -hmm. What is trauma? So awesome starting point, because I think it's really great to have a shared understanding of the term because I use it a lot. So mm -hmm. trauma is effectively the way I explain it. It's any experience that exceeds your capacity to cope in the moment, which sends you into survival mode. So that's fight, flight, freeze response. When it that's comes to when it comes to trauma, mm -hmm. and it's a common part of many people's discussions and lives and postings that they have throughout social media and, and in the media itself, these aspects of our life in which we have trauma, are we stuck in not knowing how to navigate or regulate ourselves, Or is there something you can share with us to help us down this road of learning how to regulate when we've been affected by trauma? 100%. So quite often people just feel like I have these massive responses to life and I have no control over it. And I hate the way that I respond sometimes and I'm mm. sabotaging relationships or I can't hold down a job or, you know, I'm, I'm just suffering and life's, life's hell. Um, the way that I like to just explain it is that trauma. So there's two different kinds of um, extremes, I suppose, in the way we, we explain trauma. I'm going to draw a quick graph. You know, I love a graph. Okay. All right. So we we a, love it. Yeah, you were a hit, you know, with that board, with the board. The dry erase board was a huge hit on our Instagram live that we did together uh, on Narc Abuse TV. So, so we've got like a that? graph okay. of time huh? versus stress. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what I'm going to draw is a, a tolerable stress level is about here, just for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the average person who has some experience of trauma, but mostly isn't overly affected by it and manages to live a normal life to the point where they feel like they can succeed and have healthy relationships. So they'll come into a fairly average household, might have some disrupt, disruptions, but mostly it's, it's safe and it's loving, right? So we come in about here. And then we, we go through life and we have some, as a kid, we might have some experiences, but we tend to come back here. Some experiences come back here might even come back here like that right something like that so what, what I've just described there is this is your experience of stress over time so say like as a kid you might have quite a lot of times like maybe the first day you start school and then you start high school right and this is stressful time and you might have these blips where maybe you're bullied by a kid and you have no idea how to respond and you just freeze mm -hmm. Right. right. Or the first time you're left at daycare and you're a tiny little toddler and your mum leaves you and you're standing there just crying. These are moments where we are challenged for the first time to cope with extreme stress. But what's important about this is that we are responded to in a way that helps us calm, feel safe. So we return to a really tolerable, healthy level throughout our life. We have long periods of time where things feel consistently safe. We are seen, heard, validated, which is my three terms for what love really is. When you're seen, you're heard, you're validated. Compare that to someone who's born into an abusive home where you are not seen, you are not heard, you are not validated in any way that makes you feel safe consistently. You might come into a home that's quite abusive. So you're, you're born into stress, right? So you might have even had a stressful time while you were in utero as well. That's another example. Like if you were... If you were growing in your mom's tummy while there was family violence or drug addiction or extreme poverty, right? Mm -hmm. Those things cause chronic stress in the mom and the family dynamic and that impacts that as well. So you're born into high stress. 
And then you're born into a household that doesn't see you, that doesn't meet your needs. You have this extreme response and you might actually even do this. Wow. Where for quite a long time, you experience such a degree of high stress and you're not attended to that you actually stay up here for a lot longer. Mm. And even if you do drop, you might have some consistency. You kind of sit about here. Mm -hmm. So it happens oh. again, and then you sit here, then you sit here, then you sit here, then something else happens, and then you sit here. And you might have a bit where later on in life you learn to tolerate it and things become more tolerable. But yeah. that red line is a really common experience for childhood trauma survivors. And what that we call becomes, that becomes a pattern or a lifestyle then? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if you just imagine your stress, right? So what happens when you're stressed? You get a full body response, right? You get headaches, you get gut problems, you get sweaty palms, you're highly emotionally reactive when we're stressed. If you just think about when the last time you got really stressed, how well did you attend to your child in that moment? How well did you meet your own needs in that moment? Not very well, I imagine. Not well, right? not well. Mm -hmm. No. So this is this it becomes a, a functioning survival mode. So they get really, really, really good at surviving. And they learn lots of ways to cope with consistently not having their needs met. We call this hypervigilance because in order to get your needs met, you need to be on the guard 100% of the time for when you're not going to be getting your needs met. So when is the threat coming? The threat could be an abusive parent. It could also be the absence of a parent. So it could wow. be that neglect as well as that overt abuse, right? Could also be that emotional neglect. And this is the difference between what we call big T trauma, little T trauma. You've got your big T trauma or your ones that people, everybody accepts as traumatic. Nobody questions you. Like, yeah, okay, so you were abused. You had a, a car crash. You're a, you're a mm -hmm. war veteran. There are massive traumas that everyone says, yeah, you, understandably, you're going to have issues in life and you're going to need some support to, to live a healthy life, right? Mm -hmm. trouble comes with little t trauma and when i say little i don't mean that it's less impactful just that it's less obvious is the lifestyle type kind of trauma that you get from parenting styles that consistently feel unsafe consistently don't meet the needs of the child they invalidate they belittle they bully they ignore they cold shoulder that type of parenting response where the child is demeaned for being a child and having needs, they are yeah. punished for that. Mm -hmm. And those kind of families on the surface, they look normal to everybody else. And nobody understands why that person grows up with a drug addiction or can't hold down a job or has a gambling issue or whatever, right? There's just some kind of unhealthy coping strategies born from not having your needs met as a kid and having no idea how to meet those needs for yourself healthily. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to this type of a lifestyle, trauma lifestyle, or being born into trauma, it, it can come from neglect as well as um, not necessarily abandonment, but uh, not being seen and heard. Uh, yeah. How could we? How could we really put um, a little bit more of an understanding or a label to? what makes up this lifestyle of trauma there's so many variables mm -hmm. but neglect could be one of them correct yeah yeah A abandonment maybe so i like to use the, the three phrases seen heard validated okay. and so if you imagine you've got like a four-year-old and they've just fallen over they've grazed their knee and they're crying in that moment there are a million ways you could respond to that child an abusive or a traumatic approach or response to that child would be one where they are not seen. So they're ignored, for example. Mm -hmm. They're not heard. So they're going, hey, mom, dad, I, I'm, my knee is really sore and I'm really upset, I'm crying. You, the, the parent then either ignores that, says, don't be so silly, go away. You're fine, go on, go. Or they tell you that you're wrong. So that's the invalidation, right? So it's like, that's not that bad go away mm -hmm. you're fine go away now that might sound really minor and you're thinking oh god I've done that <laughs> and I think I've done that too right but like the one-off when the kids just graze their knee is fine but if that's the way you respond to all pain all hurt all emotional upset 
that kid never learns that it's okay to be upset. They never learn that it's okay to be hurt and they're never attended to. When I say attended to, they're never loved in that response, mm. right? So if that's the way that that kid gets responded to when they fall over, what are they going to do when they're bullied at school? They come home and they say, hey, you know, mom, dad, this kid was really mean to me today and, and like, I, I got really scared. If the parents' response to that is, oh, buck up, you know, man up, woman up, whatever, like, the response is, it's just dismissive. It's not hearing them. Mm -hmm. That child feels completely invalidated. Their experience has not been seen or heard. They're not believed. They're dismissed. Now, imagine what that does to your ability to trust yourself. If you're constantly told that your lived experience of the world is wrong, incorrect, not worthy of love and attention in that moment mm -hmm. that kid basically learns oh well i'm clearly just not very important my needs are not important nobody cares if i'm her no one cares even, that i'm in pain even if that person moves through life and someone is interested in them because of that pattern they could miss that they could miss that signal that that person it wants to see them and hear them, or it's a relationship that's going to be better than their upbringing. They could not see it because yeah. of this being not loved, neglected, ignored, invalidated. It could end up being something that stunts their opportunities in life, whether it be a job, whether it be moving to a new place, to a, ro a romantic relationship. It can affect their entire outcome because of being born into stress. Yeah. So I have this um, idea that I explain as um, there's a part of your brain, right? Uh -huh. And it's called yeah. the reticular activating system. It doesn't really girl, matter. You girl, I can't write that down. Yeah, you don't need to remember <laughs> I'm taking it. taking notes, but I can't write that down. <laughs> I can I just draw to, what I think it is. I know what it's called. But, okay. um, the Wait, say it again. No, say it again. You sound all professional when you say that. Say it again. <laughs> a reticular activating system, the RAS. Wow. Okay, go ahead. All right. Now, I, I don't call it that when I work with people because nobody cares, right? Um, I call okay. it Sue, right? And Sue is my personal RAS, and she is my secretary. Okay. She's my executive assistant. And I adore okay. Sue because she does a very important job for me. What she does for me is she filters through all the information out in the world that's coming to my brain. It's yeah. coming at me all the time. She is like a big pile of paperwork on her desk and she chooses which pieces of paper to give me, right? Because she decides what's important to me. Yeah. Now, how does she know what's important to me? Well, I've trained her. I've told her over the years what's important to me. Mm -hmm. Now, if you grow up like I showed you that red line, and you grew up in survival mode, you know what's important to you? Being able to predict threat. That's right. the number one instinct. When you live in survival mode, when you're triggered into survival mode, when you exist in survival mode for years, which sadly so many people do, your brain, you have told it that the thing I need to focus on the most is where is the threat? Where is the threat? Where is the next thing that's going to come at me that I need to protect myself from, that I need to survive from? Now, that obviously looks different for everyone, depending on your experience, what your, what your childhood looked like. Mm -hmm. If it looked like that emotional, unattended parent, right, that emotionally absent parent, maybe I would even term that as emotionally abusive parent. Um, if it looked like that, what you're looking for the whole time is in relationships. You're looking for someone who's going to repeat that pattern, not attend to you, not believe you, not believe you or your experience, mm -hmm. not care about you, not prioritize you. You're not important to them. You're going to be looking for that all the time because you've programmed your executive assistant. I call mine Sue. Feel free to name yours, whatever you want. Okay. She, she's got a job to do. Her job is incredibly important. And I've trained her to look for um, weaknesses or fallibility or... How do I explain this? Um, risk. Her job is to be my little risk, risk assessor. So I've got all this stack of paperwork on her desk of all the things in the world, everything, all the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between is all stacked up on her desk that I have, my brain is received mm -hmm. in any given moment. But she knows the only thing I'm interested in is risk. Mm 
because that's the survival mode. That's my instinct that I'm driven by because I'm living up here in that survival mode, right? So she gives me all the things that provide risk. Mm. So what that does in my consciousness is I'm now aware of all the risks around me at all times, which is great if you're in the war zone, right? You need to see risk all the time. <laughs> well, yeah. Sure. You need to be able to see, like, you know, where, where's the tank coming around the corner? Or can I trust that that person over there that yeah. I'm going out into the field with? Or whatever your scenario is, right? You need to be able to, that's an amazing skill. Your brain is incredible at that. Trouble comes when we're no longer in that environment. So what you described was like later on in life, you're in a relationship. The reason why what I've just described to you is important is because unless you've done any work to rewire and retrain Sue, she's still going to be giving you all the danger all the risk all the threat all the bad all the sad all the ugly in the world so you the things that you are looking at when you look out at a scene any given scene on any given moment you are seeing it through a filter and that filter is created by your experience and if your experience was negative and unsafe that experience is going to be risk averse so it's going to be looking for risk at all times so you also what happens is i call this the trauma loop right so we have we have like that infinity symbol right mm -hmm. you have yeah. the ras or aka sue right she's my sue mm -hmm. and you have your worldview or your beliefs of the world. So what I mean by that is, do you think, is the world a good place? Are people inherently good? Um, is the world safe? Can you usually trust people? Are people generally trustworthy? Is that, is that your, like, you know, you generally accept that people are mostly good, people are mostly trustworthy. There are obviously people out there that aren't, but on the whole, the world's a pretty good place. Mm -hmm. Well, if you had the childhood like anything I've described, that is not going to be your worldview. No, that's that's the last thing you're going to see life that way or people. Right. So if you're in a relationship in your 20s and you had a, a really terrible time growing up, your worldview is going to be based on what Sue gives you every moment of every day. The world is scary. The world is unsafe. People cannot be trusted. I am not important. My, my experience of life is, is not believed by anyone. So therefore, I don't even know if I'm right. Can I even oh. trust myself? Mm -hmm. So yeah, put that person in a relationship in their 20s or 30s. They got problems. Yeah. They got massive problems because no matter how hard someone wants to love them, see them, hear them, validate them, they might be the most gorgeous partner. But if that person isn't, doesn't believe it, that's not their view of the world. Everything that person does in that relationship, <laughs> if the partner does, that sue sees as a threat sue will hand them that piece of paper see see this person can't be trusted see this oh. person didn't believe you when you said you stubbed your toe see mm. this person doesn't think you're really that sick you're telling them you're, you're sick but they don't really believe that you're that sick they don't believe mm. you they think you're lying because it's just about information that you've programmed your brain to see the world in a certain way that reinforces your worldview that continues to sabotage your life forever unless you do the work that's when I was, I was just, you made me think of that. That turns into one huge sabotage game because you're just waiting for the right shoe to drop from that other person, a boss, a sibling, yeah. uh, a, a lifetime partner, your, your husband or wife to go like, see, I knew you were going to turn out this way. I remember on that graph, my pen's not working, where we had that line like that, right? Mm -hmm. And the person was doing this. Mm-hmm. So even when they're here, even when they're within their capacity to cope, life is tolerable in that moment. They're waiting. They're just waiting for that. They're just waiting for that peak. And Sue is their, their guard dog telling them, it's coming, okay. it's coming. That's so like, even when- Go ahead, please, even please when life ahead. Is, Even when life is tolerable, it's still really shit. Excuse my language. It's still really terrible because wow. it's so stressful. And you don't believe it's going to last. And that's such an important thing when it comes to relationships. Okay, this person's wonderful and they treat me great, but it won't last. Because yeah, yeah. nothing good ever lasts. So, right? so that's your e view. Well, well, so even if they dip below the line, as it were, of stress and, and it's manageable, yeah. they're still not really calm. No. 
No because they're, they're no waiting, hat. if not sabotaged by a song that they hear or a movie they see that, oh, this person's going to do that to me just like I saw in that movie. Or this happened to me before. Or I heard my friend went through that. And I'm thinking she may do this to me too, or he's going to turn out this way, or my kid's going to be that way, just like that happened with, wow. Yeah. And then if you if you didn't fast forward to being a parent, you then will absolutely either be triggered massively by your children, which we all are anyway, because raising oh, a human well, is a bit of triggering. Yeah, yeah. But imagine doing that whilst having all of this worldview that you are so unimportant and you are so... You're so really important that you're not even seen. You're not valued. Wow. You're not believed. So then when your kid needs something, you typically what happens in, in, in trauma survivors who are not overtly abusive themselves, which is, is quite rare, to be honest, um, mostly people who are hurt try not to hurt. That's typically the way. I think it's, people are wired differently, but that's my experience. So you then come and you're a parent and you're like, well, I don't want to mess my kids up as much as I was messed up. Oh, yeah. So I want to do a better job. So you try then to do everything you possibly can to meet your kids' needs. And you might go the extreme another way. You might be like not overly attentive, like being overly attentive is bad, but you'll be like, you'll see your kid in every way and you'll validate them in every way. <laughs> you might have other things that you mess up because we do, right? But yeah. it, that's just the, the pattern of the nature of you don't, you don't want them to feel how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, it, when it comes to the trauma and understanding trauma what's the next thing that we should start looking for and in in from what i understand we need to start learning how to regulate if we understand the trauma and being born into stress and trauma being something that steps outside of our normal capacity to deal with as it yeah. were then now we got to look at uh, well how can we make sure whether we're born into stress or not are we regulating for the trauma that we have to deal with in the moment and the trauma that could be around the corner? How do we regulate? If not, we're going to be overwhelmed by every piece of trauma that we've experienced in our past. Yeah. So there's two levels to this that I teach. And the first level is how to respond when you're triggered. So that's in the moment when you've had an extreme response to what other people see as normal life. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand why you're overreacting. That, that typically is a sign that you're having a trauma response, a.k.a. triggered. Um, learning how to manage those moments is one part of it. And the second part is how to actually create long-term change so that you're triggered less often and to a less extreme of mm -hmm. amount level. So the first thing I do is physically, we need to understand our stress response. We need to understand that our body is going into fight or flight. And I talked about this in the IGTV thing, but um, when, when we're triggered, when we go into fight or flight, when we're having an extreme stress response, our brain actually shuts down and we don't have full access to everything that's going on in the brain. And, and actually, if you think of it in the terms of intelligence, our IQ actually drops. We become very primitive. And our decision-making becomes very limited. We have a very limited amount of options available to us. And they typically are fight, flight, or freeze. Wow. Okay. Um, when that happens, we need very simple tools because we don't have access to complex thinking strategies, right? So when we do talk therapy and we do talk therapy in isolation, what they tend to focus on is things to do while you're calm. And they may touch on things to do when you're highly stressed, but that's that's not been my experience. I think it's becoming more common practice, but that's a huge part of what I teach people is when you're really stressed, I know you don't have access to the really complex thinking part of your brain. So I need to teach you things to do that are simple and easy to access and don't require complex thinking patterns. We have a whole heap of... Um, tools and tips and tricks that are available to us that you can you can learn pretty much anywhere if you're interested in regulation skills and um, there's a whole list of them that I go through and um, so I, I can write them out for you so we have and these are regulation skills is that what you're saying yeah so regulation okay. skills so we have breath work okay um I'm going to put havening havening 
is a particular style of therapy that helps people um, process traumatic memories. But the way that I deal with havening is I, I just do the physical part of it. So I don't do the, the, the memory processing. That's a really deeper thing. So if you people Google havening, you'll get the whole package of what havening is. Um, in a nutshell, what havening is, is when you're, um, when you're asleep, you have delta waves that release from your brain, right? That's the way your brain functions while you're sleeping that has a calming effect on your body because when you're asleep, you're relaxed, right? Mm -hmm. Your nervous system is in calm mode, right? Okay. Um, you can actually reverse engineer that if you like. So the way that um, the brain works with delta waves is the, the nerves go through the body, but they focus in particular areas of the body. So they focus in the palms, the cheeks, and the outsides of the shoulders. Hmm. so if you stimulate those areas of your body by just rubbing your hands together i do this hmm. you can do it with me if you like see how you feel i went to sleep while i was doing it though i'm just interested how you feel i usually get like a bit of a tingly makes me want to take a deep breath or you might not feel anything which is totally fine too Hey, you kind of say I'm dead or what? No. <laughs> Some people are slightly more sensitive I've, to this than others. I felt something, but I was going to sleep. I just didn't want to tell you that. But so that's just the physical part. So you can also rub your shoulders. You can also rub your face. Okay, that's they're the physical elements that you stimulate the nerve endings that trigger delta wave production in the brain. So when you're super stressed, have you noticed that when you're stressed, you rub your face? You know when people like they, they put their head in their hands? And they might rub their face. Or if a baby's crying, we might stroke the cheek. Or if someone's upset, we might go and just rub their shoulder. I'm telling you, I'm going to start going to sleep. You keep me doing this. <laughs> well, you know the phrase like wringing your hands? You know the okay. phrase wringing your hands? Got it. Got it. So we all really do this stuff instinctively when we're stressed. We just didn't know why it worked. Now okay, we know so why it works. The three areas are the cheeks, the hands, and the sides of the arms, right? Outside arms? of the shoulders, yeah. Just like, Outside of the shoulders, okay. Yeah, so that's the havening response. Got it. Um, what else we have? So we have another thing called the vagus nerve activation. So the vagus nerve, um, for anyone who's never heard of it before, it's nothing to do with Las Vegas. It's a <laughs> I'm nerve. Glad you, I'm glad you cleared that up. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> There's a nerve that runs from your brain stem through to the your sit bones right so the bottom of your spine and it goes into every major organ and it's the only nerve that has that real um, mind body connection so it's the literal brain body connecting element okay. Got it. it actually has an impact on um, the way your body functions so if you can access that nerve through your body you can actually send a signal back to your brain that you are actually calm and safe when your brain is thinking that you're not calm and safe because it's been triggered. Okay, so if you can access that nerve, you're talking to your brain. Pretty much, yeah. And yeah. it's it's a uh, it's spelled how? How do you spell it? Not um, not, v, not like the word Vegas or the city, right? V A G U S. And now okay. I've said that, I'm now thinking, oh God, is that the way you spell it? <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it is. Okay, so the vagus nerve activation is what you said. Okay, go ahead. What else? Um, and there's different ways to do that. And I'm going to teach you one at the end. Okay. Sensory experiencing. So I'll just write it up here as well. Vagus nerve and sensory. Um, sensory experiencing is literally using your senses to ground you in the here and now in a way that feels good. So you could do things like if your nan wore a particular perfume and, you know, and that brings you a sense of peace because you adored your nan, that's a, stimu that's a sensory stimulation that when you sniff that, if you put that on like a hanky and you keep that on your, up your sleeve because you're, you know, you're going for, you know, your day's going to be stressful. Whenever you feel stressed, if you have a bit, bit of a sniff on that hanky and you're reminded of your nan and that makes you feel good and calm, that will send a signal to your brain of a memory of nan, which makes you feel good and calm. So mm. it can counter that stress response. Mm. Yeah. And you can use all of your senses to engage your body in that way. Okay. So we've got rhythm. I always spell rhythm wrong. R-H-Y? Yeah. Rhythm. People can wildly underestimate this element. 
if you think of um, when your baby cries, what do you do? Oh, my mine don't mine don't do it anymore. They're all grown. <laughs> I don't, I don't well, remember. Oh, I don't remember. It's such a long baby time. Cries, you 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 pick them up. You pick them up. And you may pat them on the back with a nice rhythm. Yeah. You might pat them on the back. To, yeah. To coo them or sing to them some something rhythmic. Yeah, you might sing. You might bounce them. Drive yeah, for hours. Might... Drive for hours in the circle. It, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. right. Some type of rhythm to get them. It's the nature of of something that repeats. If something okay. repeats, it's known, it's predictable. If you know it's coming, you don't have to fear that it's coming because you know it's coming. It's mm-hmm. soothing, it's calming because it's predictable, it's known. Your brain says, oh, we know this. We know what this feels like. We know what this is going to feel like in two minutes. We know what this is going to feel mm-hmm. like in five minutes. And it feels good so I can start to calm. So rhythm in an adulthood is so important. We, we forget that just because, you know, we did this for babies, well, we're still the same organism. We're still the same mm-hmm. physical being. We're just bigger <laughs> and often with more stress. So if anything, we need more soothing. So if you've got someone in your life who can hold you and rock you, go for it. <laughs> well, but it could yeah. be, that sometimes, could look like. Sometimes I need to be burped, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah, that's, but, a, that's yes, a whole nother story. Whole other... like, whatever works. You know, yeah. if, if quite often it is literally just, I need a big hug. And while you're hugging, naturally we sway we just naturally sway if you hold someone for long enough you'll you'll start you'll want to move right it's a soothing kind of experience our body is soothed by it um so rhythm in adulthood can look like um dance yoga um walking running Mm -hmm. clapping chanting anything that has that kind of rhythmic feel to it all right um, and routine and predictability is another one. So you know, this is fascinating. This is truly fascinating for me. And I'm glad I was an audience of one because I get to listen to this and not be interrupted, uh, even though I love my viewers and my audience. But go ahead. W- what is this one here? So routine and predictability. Oh, um, okay. If you imagine you grew up in a, in, a, in a home where you never knew what was going to happen next and you yeah. knew whatever it was, it wasn't going to be good. And yeah. even if it was good, sometimes that was even worse because then you got to have a bit of a high knowing it's only going to come back down again. That is, that, right? is, that is so common with people who write and talk to me about the show. that They talk about their lives and they, they mention this happens to them, which you just said. And you're saying a routine because they didn't have one. This is very important for them to learn how to regulate yeah. their trauma. By, yeah. having a, by having a routine. Your body needs to know what's going to happen each day because it didn't ever know. And that fear of the unknown causes stress. So in adulthood, you're still living that pattern until you address it, right? So you, first of all, you know you're in that pattern and then two, you do something about it. Mm-hmm. So I'm speaking to the people out there today who know they're in that pattern and they're here because they want to do something about it, right? So yeah, they're in that right. stage of I want to yeah. change. So if you can introduce a pattern of predictability in your life, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. a routine, you begin to have less stress because you know what each day is going to bring for you. That means, realistically, for me, please correct me. Mm. That means, based upon just the few that we've talked about, what I'm looking at, six things there you have on the board, just that. We have a lot of power to regulate the trauma that has happened to us or we experience. Yeah. Because this is different than what we were talking. You started with at the beginning talking about, you know, people having their life. I mean, I get it from the shows that we do on narcissism and relationships and recovery. I have no power is a common expression. Yeah. This sets everything in a different, in a different motion because we're talking understanding this just having the beginning of understanding of it is an intentionality to our existence instead of just thinking our hands are thrown up and there's nothing we can do to regulate trauma but we can yeah and this is why I'm so passionate about it because I've worked with kids in care who've suffered trauma and I've seen them go on to either recover or or really not recover and suffer and Mm -hmm. then I've worked with adults I've worked with prisoners I've worked with violent offenders I've worked with 
um, people who are struggling with addiction, have, have worked with parents who've had their children removed, and everyone has this consistent pattern in their lives mm. of life was really hard growing up. I felt very unsafe, very unloved. There might have been, and we've talked about this, like one person, right? You might have had someone who believed yeah. in you and that person is vital. Yeah. I can come to that later. But generally, if your lived experiences, nobody cared about me. I was not important to anyone. So therefore, life's just going to carry on in this way forever and it's going to be terrible. And I'm just stuck in survival mode. And I don't believe because of my worldview, right? Because of, because of Sue doing her amazing job for me, that the world is a good place then I just have to stay in this survival mode in order to survive this terrible world that I live in, right? When I see that, it just it makes me so passionate about just get, I want to get hold of that person and just bring them into like my room or this space that's safe for me and for this person and just be like, this doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things yeah. you can do and I want to work with people to teach them that if you feel stuck, slowly introducing elements of this to keep your body in a place that's coming down means your IQ will come up because you're no longer in fight or flight. So therefore you have more access to your brain. You can make better decisions. You're more open to learning. Imagine a kid going through school. Yeah. If their home life is dangerous, mm -hmm. they, their IQ, so people get often misdiagnosed with things like ADHD or ADD or autism or some kind of learning disability, even dys dyslexia, dyspraxia, all those kinds of functioning diagnoses, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in any way to dismiss people who genuinely have those conditions and suffer with those. The, the, what I've definitely witnessed in my life is children who have been misdiagnosed with those diagnoses based on the way they present because the person who's diagnosing them doesn't have an understanding of trauma, that trauma-informed approach to medicine or to treatment of mental health or of behavior is becoming a new thing, but it's not there yet. It's not mainstream yet. So, so many people in the world are going to see their GP, even going to see therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists and getting diagnoses that don't account for their experience and how they've been wired to survive if you can just bring your body down you mm -hmm. have an exponentially i say exponentially increased that means the same thing but increased capacity yeah. to heal to thrive to change mm -hmm. to grow to learn the higher arousal level you are like the higher stressed you are the less capacity you have to manage anything the calmer you are the more everything opens up in your mind you have more access to all of your learned, all of your learned experiences or your lessons or your memories, all the important stuff that's kept you alive, but also the things that have made you happy. And, and a person is probably in a position to be more creative as well. 100%. So that's the other thing as well. So, um, so we've got routine, yeah. we've got physical mm -hmm. exercise. So I'll just talk about that one quickly. All right. um, physical exercise. Your body gets flooded with stress hormones, right? So you, you live in a stressed response. Your body is constantly primed to fight, flight, or freeze. The hormones that you need to do that are adrenaline and cortisol. I'm sure there are more, but they're the main two. Adrenaline and cortisol are designed to give you energy and speed for short bursts mm -hmm. in order to run away from the threat, right? That's how we have been, that's how we've evolved over, over well, it depends on what you believe in regards to evolution, but, you know, millions of years life on this planet has had to survive threat in order to do that the brain of the creature has a survival response we have that very primitive part of our brain which is the same as a lizard's brain that's why they call it the lizard brain which is your survival instinct it's incredibly primitive and it floods the body with stress hormones now, if you are genuinely not in threat, but your brain thinks you are, so you're sitting in your classroom or you're sitting at your desk at work or you're watching TV with your partner and your brain goes somewhere that causes you stress, your body gets flooded with that <coughs> stress response and it feels terrifying because you feel like you're being attacked, but you're looking around and you're like, I'm just sitting at my desk. I'm just watching TV. I'm just in my classroom. 
why do I feel? And you people think they're going crazy, that they have sweats, their blood rushes to their head, they can't think anymore because their brain capacity is dropped, all of that. I teach people to recognize those physical symptoms as a clue or as a cue to need to calm. Because if you keep going up and up and up, you have less access to your brain, right? So we want to, we want to, as soon as we realize we're being triggered, as soon as we realize we're stressed, we need to focus on things that we know work for us that bring us down. So when a person starts to focus on those things, you're physically trying to focus on things to calm ourselves down. Is that what you're pretty much saying? So with physical exercise, the hormones need to go somewhere. Right. So when your body's flooded with stress hormones, mm -hmm. they're designed to be used physically. So if you can go for a quick run, do 10 jumping jacks, do some press ups. If you're sitting at your desk, I teach um, is a process called progressive muscle relaxation. All it basically means is you tense for as long as you can tense and then you let go. And you do that on the top half of your body and then the bottom half of your body. And what that does is it gets your muscles to burn off that cortisol, burn off that adrenaline. So the stress hormones have to go somewhere because that yeah. is, I, I love the beauty of what you just said there in so many different ways, but I love the way you're describing everything without a doubt, this is a designed behavior to a designed being us. Yeah. It's not random. It's just, you're, I mean, you're able to label these because it's a formula for success. Uh, but the physical aspect, running, jumping, jumping jacks, there are a number of things that we can do. We can't just sit and think about it and then it goes away, right? We have to literally do something is what you're saying. Yeah. Whatever it may be, everybody's different, but you know, everybody's got to figure out what they yeah. comfortably can do, but it's better than just sitting there letting something take over. Uh, even though there may not be a physical threat there in our mind, we may get what from a nightmare or something may cross our mind, right? You're saying triggered. Something may get triggered, right? We still may need to do something so we can burn off that. Yeah. Or will that become a pattern if we don't do anything? I mean, I'm just, I'm asking, I don't know. Yeah. So, okay. So there's a few things in what you just said that I'd like to talk about. So um, people say, oh, it's only in your mind. It's all in your head. Yeah, right. That's what I'm kind of right? leading for. Yeah, and right, right, right. What I, what I always say is, what is, what, why does that mean it's less important? Why does, why does, because it's all in your mind, mean it's dismissive somehow. Your mind controls your body. Right. So if, you're, if it's in your mind, it's controlling your body. So if you think something, your body's going to react like it's happening because you're telling it it's happening. So if you're sitting there and you're having these thoughts and your body starts reacting, because we tell people it's all in your mind. Hmm. Nothing's wrong. Why are you freaking out? Everything's fine. Right? that person doesn't understand these two realities don't make sense to them because their lived experience is terrifying and you're telling me everything's safe. Well, that's completely incongruent. That doesn't make sense at all. So that makes them further doubt themselves. They then have even more um, or less capacity to believe themselves, to believe their own experiences. So they genuinely think they're going crazy. So like just, it's such a common experience where they just, don't trust themselves at all because they're constantly told that what they're experiencing is not true. It's not happening. So a person has, has to approach whatever they're experiencing. Uh, well, so how does that work then? Does that mean that the person then looks at what they're thinking as true or do they try to do something physically so that they can burn off the stress hormones that are making them think that it's true or happening in the moment? So I'd say both. Yeah, I'd say both, because if you're denying your experience, you're continuing mm. the pattern of trauma, right? You're invalidating yourself. You're continuing that lived right. experience. Right. Of, uh, I, without I a doubt. About, right. right. Without a so doubt. We, right. we try to learn to flip that. So we start by just paying attention to our body, pay attention to what's happening, acknowledging what's happening. Now, for people who experience trauma, being in the body can be quite an unsafe feeling. So I teach people to do it slowly, gradually. There's a few things that I, I teach, which I'm going to do one at the end, actually, about how to reconnect to the body. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, I just wanted to say, just remembered something I didn't say about this was water, is water also helps to flush out hormones. So okay. if, if you experience high amounts of anxiety, drink mm -hmm. more water. If you, if you get triggered daily, if you have lots of experiences in life that really stress you out, drink more water. 
as well as moving your body. Those things will flush out those hormones and your experience of high stress will reduce in length. So you might still have your peaks until you do the work, but they won't last as long. They will reduce in length, not yeah. necessarily intensity per se. Is what not until you really start doing the work because you're still going to be triggered in the same way until you start to mm -hmm. see the so, world differently, experience the world differently. So we're talking about drinking water, d diluting, as it were, the stress and stretching it out, giving your, your body and yourself enough time to build a routine, uh, to, to work with your sensory, to the vagus nerve. We, we're able to kind of control things or give ourselves a start by making sure we move our bodies and drink water. Does that give us more room to do all the other things? Yeah. Well, so what, what we do is when, when we're stressed, we have this rush overtakes our body overtakes our mind shuts everything down and we sit mm -hmm. in this panic mode if okay. you was to go and drink a pint of water and breathe deeply and just move your body for that would take you about a minute so if you could do that well if, if you drink a lot of water you are going to move your body toward the restroom and you're definitely going to be breathing panting to make sure you get there quickly i get what you're okay. saying no i'm just joking i'm, I'm gonna just talk joking. about i'm just joking go ahead I'm going to talk about breath work in a minute because obviously that's such an important thing and that's something I want to teach you guys as well. But um, I would yeah, be running to the restroom, moving my body and panting heavily as I try to drink, as I drink that water. I could see the water being very beneficial to that. You better put a smile on your face. I'm making a joke here. All right. So, <laughs> I'm just joking. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whatever <laughs> don't give me that fake laugh that's all right don't, um, don't give, hey don't give me that laugh that's the laugh you give your your kid when they make a joke and it's not funny go ahead oh <laughs> uh, i forgot what i was gonna say so oh no you so can't what forget does, what okay, you're gonna so, say so you said about it reducing okay so what, what i meant by that is when we get a stress response sometimes we can live there for oh. days okay right sometimes we can live there for minutes sometimes we can live there for hours often a, a really common period of time is about half hour to 45 minutes it usually mm -hmm. takes someone about an hour to calm down. But if you have a really high reactive stress response, you can live there. People would live up there, but that's their lived experience is up here. For days. So, for days, for years. There might be slight ups and downs, but yeah, like, you know, I talked about that red line. So they're locked yeah. in. Okay. So now then what? So if you, if you, what I was saying about moving your body and exercising, it flushes the hormones out. So your body starts to calm before your mind has really even started to do anything different. So it kind of just gives you that your body starts to chill out and you go, oh, if I'm feeling less, less stressed, maybe the threat's passed. So your subconscious then just kind of starts to naturally calm. So that's why that's really important. But the body calms down first. Yeah. Brain catches up later. Yeah. Well, the brain, you can't engage the brain. You've lost access to the brain. You're in, you're in like survival mode, which is your lizard brain, right? You don't have access to all this beautiful knowledge that we learn. Why, in. You, why you keep trying to tell me that I, I'm a lizard? I, I'm we better looking. I'm better looking. No, no, you better talk about your family. My family ain't lizards, girl. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. All right, go ahead. You were we're saying, all lizards. Go ahead. It causes go a lot ahead. of problems, but it keeps us alive. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. so, and the other one, there's two more, and it's one is tapping or EFT. Lots of people have heard of that. It's, you know, the where people do this. Wait, wait, show, yeah, I was going to say, show me. Okay. So they do this. I'm, I'm you know, you, you, have to, you, have to, you have to show the tapping because my viewers will think you're talking about the tapping of dancing. Dancing. Yeah, no, okay. okay. So That's not what we're talking about. Will you please clarify that? Well, I mean, yeah. there's nothing wrong in that. I mean, clarify. I don't want to make people mad at me. But there's nothing wrong in that. But that's not what you're talking about in this moment. No. So um, tapping is a therapeutic response to stress. It helps tap into, no pun intended, the energy oh, centers. Wait, of, wait of did you just body. tell a joke? Did you just do a joke? Not that intentionally. Was really funny. Okay, all right, go um, ahead. <laughs> I'm not naturally funny. <laughs> yes, you are. I'm accidentally funny. <laughs> My viewers thought you were funny, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and tapping is, there's, there's heaps of apps out there. That I love the tapping solution is a great app. Um, and it teaches you how to, if you tap certain areas of your body, there's energy centers, much like mm -hmm. you know, how acupuncture focuses on energy centers of the body. Yes. Um, yes. And if you do that whilst also retraining your thoughts, so you often have mantras or statements that you'll say on repeat while you're tapping, it helps to access different parts of your brain to just calm it down and rewire it. So it's incredible, but it takes practice. I have not done a lot of tapping, 
Um, I tried it a few times and it doesn't, I don't really like it. It's not, but maybe I'll grow to like it. Who knows? Everything's not for everyone. Okay. And we are talking about tapping because there is a slapping app as well. So that's not what you're talking about. You What's that? About... I don't know what that is. <laughs> I just made that up. But yeah, okay. I was just kidding. Uh, I hope there's not a slapping app. Somebody probably will tell me, oh, there is. Okay. So we're talking tapping. Yep. And this is uh, something we do to ourselves. Uh, it's not something per se uh, that we have someone else do for us. It's something no, we, we can do. We do it to ourselves. And then the last one is fun and play. Now, when you are highly stressed, the last thing you want to do is start like bouncing a ball, right? Or doing drawing or playing with Play-Doh. But if you can, if you start to feel stressed and you pull out mm -hmm. a coloring book or you start bouncing a ball, one, you get the rhythm from the bouncing of the ball as well. So it's kind of, it's a, a double whammy, if you like. Um, and if you start to get Play-Doh, if you have like some Play-Doh and you keep it on your desk at work, or a stress ball that's a squidgy <laughs> one right something no, that no you, you that. can't you can't bring that up if you don't have play-doh at your desk do you have play-doh where you work um well i work in a therapy office so of course i have play-doh <laughs> <laughs> but you can get right. like adult versions like like um there's therapy so it's kind of like an it doesn't look like play-doh and it's more like okay. a silicon based thing okay. um but it, it, it brings out a part of you that is your, your child, right? Okay. And play is calming, play is soothing. So play is really important for a trauma survivor. Quite often kids had to grow up way too fast. They didn't get to play. So yeah. if, as an adult, you can engage in play. It's such a beautiful thing to do. It's quite often not what you would do first of all when you're triggered. Like if you're having a massive stress response, you won't go and go find the play though. But once you've done some of these things, you might finish off with that. Okay. What, what, what if I just want to do that? Then um, you can try, but quite okay. often we're too stressed. We're quite often it's like we, we want to cry. We want to scream. We want to punch something. We want to go and hide. We want to run away. So if we're having a massive stress response, we might be able to grab something like a squidgy stress ball or a lump of Play-Doh, and that might help just manage the feeling of stress. It also keeps us moving. It stimulates the, the palms, which is what triggers the delta wave thing, like the havening. So it's actually, it's multi-sensory and it can counteract your stress response on multiple levels. Yeah, I have a question. Go for it. My question is, you just mentioned a, a number of things there that I wanted to write down, scream, cry, run away. What, are, what other things do we want to do when we're, we're stressed? Punch someone. You said break punch. something. <laughs> break something. What else? Some people hurt themselves. Some people, you know, hit themselves, hurt themselves, punish themselves. Um, and self one of them. Self-harm. Self -harm. Okay, yep. what else? Um, and one of the major ones is numbing. So we numb, we dissociate, we, and dissociation is where your focus is somewhere else other than in the here and now. Okay. I'm not present. Yeah. Numbing. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you can think offhand that people can look as a clue to immediately try to implement some of these uh, nine to 10 things that you have there on the board. I don't know. What do you got back there? 10, you got three, six, uh, eight, that's yeah. nine, nine different things or. The 10, I can't tell. 10. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, we're looking at uh, sometimes uh, a person may want to scream, cry, run away, punch something, punch, hit a wall, do hit something, break something, self-harm, numb, or in other words, not be present in the moment uh, to deflect. Anything else that you can think of that uh, men, women, uh, even if they're looking at their children dealing with something, so that we're not lashing out at someone that's trying to maybe learn how to regulate. Maybe they don't know how to regulate, but these can be some of the telltale signs that a person is being overstressed. Okay, uh, person so, overeat too, or no? What? Yeah, person? 100%. So that's the numbing. That's the, I want oh, that's to, the numbing. I, yeah, but no, that's part of the numbing. So it's like scrolling okay. on social media for hours. Oh, that's a good one. High salty, fatty, sugary, sugary foods. It's okay. anything that overrides the uncomfortableness of the yeah. trauma response with yeah. something pleasurable. So it could also be anything sexual as well. So like porn or just um, porn, over right. being highly sexually active or um, anything that gives you a counter experience to try and get rid of this one. 
Now, now, if that's the case, these tools. Oh, I tur- I put my head down. I looked up, and they were gone. So the tools that you highlighted, the ten, can can move a person away from these uh, as being a lifestyle. These things mentioned for one or two or three of them: scream, cry, break, numbing. It can become a lifestyle to deal with something. But you just gave us something that we may need to implement in our life, right? You just gave us 10 things we need to start looking at that we need to start doing so that we can protect ourselves. And now we're going to look at some cues that yeah, can I'll give just write us down what you've said. So that's really important. So cues to that you are having a stress response, basically, that you're in technically, a, technically yeah. Mm-hmm. somewhere on the scale of having a stress mm-hmm. response. It could be quite mild, it could be quite extreme. But the, the early warning signs, your breath, right? So your breath becomes really shallow. I describe it with my hands. So these are your lungs. And when we breathe, um, when we're in fight or flight, we do this. <laughs> it's a really shallow, it's up here yeah, in the top right. part of our lungs and our shoulders do it, right? Yeah. When we breathe deeply and calmly, we breathe from our belly and we go. You get about 75% more oxygen that way. Oh, yeah, and right. it's a lot slower because you can't fill up your lungs quickly like that. Like you have to, it's, it takes a bit longer to do. It requires use of your diaphragm and your abdomen muscles, yeah. which is more, more of a full body experience. And, we're and it talking, also takes focus. Uh, uh, it takes focus. We're also talking about getting more oxygen to the brain then. 100%, yeah. And, and when the shallow, are, the shallow's not giving you that and you're pretty much running not even half speed as a human, you're really shortchanging yourself in every way, L- organs, everything. I'm sorry, go ahead. You were going to say? No, that, that's 100%. Yeah, I like that. So um, you might notice that you turn to eating. So you've oh. had a stressful day. You've just come off a phone call and it was really annoying and frustrating. And the first thing you do is walk to the fridge. You know, right. you're trying to numb that stress response that's come up for you. And that could be because the person shouted at you on the phone and you were shouted at as a kid and you just are, it, it hurt. To have someone shout at you as an adult hurt yeah, yeah. and you don't want to hurt you want to feel good so what do you do your brain says well i know what feels good go and eat some sugar yeah yeah yep, yep, i love yep, it yep, when you eat sugar yeah yeah your brain doesn't actually love sugar but we think it does um yep. i'm gonna put here sweat okay mm-hmm. when, when we have a stress response our body is being primed to do something physical so we, we will sweat mm-hmm. we will get flushed we'll get like a mm-hmm. blood rush mm-hmm we might feel flush in our cheeks. We often get like a, like a pressure buildup in our neck and our jaw and the back of our head. It's like, it's literally like a blood rush to the head. Okay. Um, and it's actually not, it, it's actually this adrenaline that does mm-hmm. that, but it feels yeah. really hot. So we get a blood rush. Um, what else might we do? Jaw, might clench our jaw. Okay. So if you notice someone who clenches their jaw a lot, they're quite often suppressing stress mm-hmm. people who are very busy and they they don't sit still so they can't be still with themselves the the hyperactivity nature of trauma response is that if i keep busy i don't have to think or feel because thinking and feeling hurts and feels horrible and reminds me of stuff I don't want to think about or feel. So I'm going to just keep super busy. And that's where you get like the really busy, like mum response. It does happen for dads too, but I see it a lot more with mums where they're just like on the go all the time. Yeah. They don't yeah. stop. And when they mm-hmm. stop, they drink wine, they watch crap TV and they go to bed. Like it's not, they don't stop to meditate or, you know, <laughs> journal. Right, <laughs> like, right, right it's still like go 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 and even when i stop physically i'm still gonna numb and then i'm gonna go to bed mm-hmm. so it's, it's not it's like tolerating life mm-hmm. you're not really loving life or living life you're just tolerating life mm-hmm. they're stressed and they're just tolerating life yeah we can easily fall into that or we're um, stressed and just tolerating life go ahead you were gonna say explosive so if you become quite explosive, it doesn't have to mean violent, but obviously being physically violent is, is, is a form of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so explosive could just mean like 
verbally too, right? So you just, you, it's like the Coke bottle scenario. You, the, the lid is burst off and you have this explosion because you've tried to hold it in for so long and the stress is building and building and building and your kid asks you for the 15th time can I have a chocolate bar and you go no I said you can't have a chocolate bar like so the response is like yes that was annoying but did it was that did that really make sense did, right. was it warranted for the situation often no for trauma survivors because mm -hmm. often it's the 15th time you asked for a chocolate bar was on top of all the memories of trauma I've been reliving all day so it's like, I, that, I'm not responding to you, I'm responding to you on top of what I'm already responding to. Got it.